Welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson. And today we are going to be reconvening with Paul Tremblay for part two of our interview. If you missed part one, then just head on back one episode to part 98, where we spoke to Paul about his new novel, Disappearance at Devil's Rock. His novel of the year in the This Is Horror Awards last year, A Head Full of Ghosts, Story Ideas, The Power of a Stephen King Tweet, and much, much more. Now, before we get into the interview, just a quick word from the first one of our sponsors, Grey Matter Press. They're among us. They live down the street in the apartment next door and in our own homes where they stare back at us from our bathroom mirrors. Peel Back the Skin is a volume of horror that rips the mask off the real monsters of our time, mankind. Featuring a star-studded cast of award-winning authors, Jonathan Mayberry, Tim LeBon, Ray Garden, Graham Masterson, and many more, Peel Back the Skin is the powerhouse new release from Grey Matter Press. Get more info at peelbacktheskin.com. Okay, so that was Grey Matter Press talking about their new anthology, Peel Back the Skin. Lots of great authors on that, so if you haven't, then, you know, do head on over and check it out. As you know, this is episode 99 of the This Is Horror podcast. So next weekend, which is Saturday the 2nd and Sunday the 3rd of July, we will be hosting a live podcast for episode 100 with David Moody. We're just finalising the details, but it is looking like it will be on Sunday the 3rd of July at around 5pm Greenwich Mean Time, running until around about 7pm. And we thought that would be a great time to do it because at 8pm it is the quarterfinal of Euro 2016. And if England have defeated Iceland then they will be playing France. And so we know a lot of our listeners and probably Dan Howarth more than anyone would like to tune into that at 8 p.m. So yeah, 5 till 7. No conflict with England's match. If they even get that far, who knows? Okay, so before we get into the interview with Paul, we have a second sponsor message. And this is from Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. Cherrywood Lodge is haunted, and thank fuck for its ghost. Rebecca Malone has problems, not just alcohol. Her biggest issues start with the moment she discovers a chest of ancient Majon tiles in the basement of her new house, causing her life to spin out of control with hallucinations, sexual deviances, and grossly murders. Ghost dongs and haunted houses and demon orgies, oh my. Jessica McHugh's The Train Derails in Boston is now available online wherever books are sold. All right, fantastic message there for The Train Derails in Boston by Jessica McHugh. A novel that I'm very excited to start reading. Probably should have started already, to be honest. I mean, there's been, goodness, enough buzz about it. And I do hope that one day, yeah, maybe maybe even next month, we can get Jessica on the podcast. This might even be the first time that Jessica's finding out about this. I know she's a... Patreon supporter and I know that she listens to the podcast but yeah Jessica let's do it let's get you on the podcast and run an interview and of course speaking of interviews here we go let's get into it part two the one and only Mr. Paul Tremblay and now for a horror interview How long do you find it takes you to write those 500 words? I mean, I'm imagining it really does vary from day to day. And I remember from the last time that we spoke that you said in terms of where you write or when it could right. be anywhere. I remember you <laughs> saying that you wrote on the basketball court. Well, probably not on it, but at the <laughs> right, sidelines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, um, yeah, so I had mentioned last year that for when I was working on Disappearance of Devil's Rock, my son was doing uh, baseball clinics in the bottom of the school gymnasium, uh, college gymnasium, 
you know, one end there was basketball courts and the other end they were playing baseball and I was going to be there for an hour and 45 minutes. I'm like, well, I could just sit here or I could actually get some of the work done that has to get done. So yeah, I wrote like a fairly sizable chunk of the book sitting in the bowels of that uh, gymnasium. Yeah, the time can depend. Like last night, for example, uh, like I wrote for an hour and a half and only managed 400 words. Uh, well, I say only because I didn't make my 500 word count, but I felt like I had untangled like a, a snarly, snaggy paragraph that was sort of bothering me for a couple of days. So I felt good about that. And like I said, you know, it's okay. You got to allow yourself to not hit the, the daily word count and not get too crazy about it. Well, I'm glad that it was a baseball clinic rather than, you know, the game. It's like, oh, yeah, I'll go and watch your game. <laughs> yeah, but no. also, come on, an hour and a half, I've got to get right. some work done. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> I would do that. I might sneak a, a book to a game, but yeah, I won't, I won't, I won't sit there with my laptop. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> headphones. <laughs> yeah. So in regards to writing in, the, in the, this book and in the head full of ghosts, one of the things I noticed is that you do the uh, first person present tense. And it's not just that you do it that way is that you probably do it better than anyone else I've ever written. Oh, so geez. is that, is that like a conscious effort or is that from the editor saying, mm. Hey, you need to try it this way. Uh, maybe you could elaborate on, on that actual, uh, technique because it's like i said I've, I've read some some pretty good first person present tense and uh, uh -huh. but yours is smooth it's well thank smooth. you <laughs> yeah i've i have sort of it's sort of a style that i've, I've fallen in love with and uh, <clears throat> the first writer that i can remember sort of encountering who used it a ton was uh, you know is chuck polanuck um you know I, I read his the first novel of his that i read was choke uh, and i just loved it it's like oh wow this just sounded so like immediate and and fresh to me. Um, I was sort of instantly drawn to the idea of present tense. I don't know. I feel like writing present tense, it's easier to deal with when you go to the past too, instead of, <laughs> you know, perfect past or whatever the heck the name of those clauses are when you're writing in past tense. Um, as far as point of view, I mean, I tend to be drawn to first person as well. I, I, I sort of like that challenge. Um, I mean, we exist in first person, obviously we exist in first person present or most of us do. Uh, you know, to me, I, I love the idea of building characters through, you know, other characters through one person's point of view. Because, I mean, that's that's all how we know other people. Like, we can't get in their heads. We can only right. know other people by what they say and what they do. Um, but, you know, as I've gotten older, I really do try to make point of view. The choice of point of view has to be, it has to fit the story. It has to work with the story. I can't force it on there. So, you know, for instance, a head full of ghosts would not have worked in third person. Um, it would have felt like a cheat, you know, with all the information, you know, with, if I were to do it as third person and then sort of, you know, muck around with, did this happen or did this not happen? I think that really would have felt like a cheat to the reader. The only way to do that story or the only way to tell that story would be through Mary. Um, right. and consequently, when I, when I had the idea for disappearance at devil's rock, I knew that it would not work as first person as well. I had to, I had to do it from multiple point of views. Um, I think it would have been a mess to try to do first person, different voices, you know, um, the story you know, required did, multiple perspectives. It did. And, and you can do multiple perspectives in first person, but I think it has to be like a really long novel. Like, um, Marlon Jones's, uh, Br a brief history of seven killings is this huge, you know, that's probably like 200,000 words. It's a brilliant novel and it's all, and it's a bunch of different characters and it's all first person, but because the book is so long, he has the room and the space to be able to create, you know, um, to be able to create the distinct voices for each of the character point of view characters that he uses. Um, right. I, I, I wasn't planning on, I couldn't do that with disappearance of devil's rock. It didn't need to be that big of a novel. So, yeah. So I knew that that couldn't be first person, although I, I did sneak in some first person stuff like, you know, diary entries and, and police reports and stuff like that. So I couldn't right. go totally without first person. And actually, that felt like a big challenge to me because all my novels previously were first person. You know, I'd, I'd written, I have written short stories that are third person, but never a novel. So all right, so even when I started the book, that made me feel a little bit uncomfortable. You know, in a good way. Um, you know, because if you're not feeling uncomfortable, then I don't think you're, you're challenging yourself at all. Um, but that just added it to the list of sort of pressures that I was putting on myself for Devil's Rock. But it all worked out in the end. Definitely, I, I bet. <laughs> Well, speaking of discomfort and making yourself uncomfortable, I think that ties in to self-doubt, which is something 
Uh, you spoke about as part of a Lit Reactor column that I put together, and you said uh-huh. that you struggle with self-doubt every time you write. So I thought if we could tap into that a little bit, I mean, where do you think it stems from? What have been some of your lowest points and how do you tackle it? And, and as I'm saying that, I'm yeah. feeling like, bloody hell, it's turning into a counselling session or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jeez, uh, lowest points. Um, yeah, and it is that like lovely, right. cheery question for a Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, you know, we joke about, but it is, it's sort of, I mean, it's part of, it's part of being a writer, unfortunately, or, or maybe fortunately. Mm. I mean, and if you're, able to sort of work through it, you're going to succeed. And if you're not, and that's okay if you can't get over it because it can be a soul sucking pride beating, (laughs) uh, you know, profession or, or, um, yeah, we'll call it profession for now. Uh, I don't know. I think my lowest was when no sleep to wonderland came out with Henry Holt. Uh, it had an awful cover. My editor, my, the editor who acquired me had left. I mean, the editor I had after that was very good, but you know, usually when you get a, when your editor leaves, you know, you're, that's your champion for the book. Um, you know, that's the one who bought your book and, you know, who believed in you in the first place, you know, to put their reputation on the line to sign you. So when your editor leaves, it's, it's usually not a good sign, um, of things to come. And also like the, the publisher itself was going through a change in leadership. And, um, so this was February, the book was coming out February, 2010. And this is when Macmillan, who owns Henry Holt and, you know, a bunch of other publishers, was fighting with Amazon over the price of ebooks. And Amazon decided to pull all of Macmillan's books off their shelves for a week. And that week happened to be my release week. <laughs> uh, you know, so that just, you know, basically killed the book dead. I mean, I think it was going to be dead already, but it certainly didn't help to, to not have your book available the week it comes out on Amazon. Um, so that was definitely a low point, And Henry Holt was just kind of like, yeah, see you later. So yeah, I think I mentioned that Lit Reactor column. That was you know a year or two after that. I was pretty bitter and full of self pity, and it took a while to sort of you know to work out of that to get out of that. It's funny though. I feel like you can remember sort of low points in books uh, that you're writing. Like with uh, a head full of ghosts, I sent my agent the first like a hundred pages. Um, he was you know he's like oh, this is pretty good, but you know does it have to be first person? Which sort of threw me for a loop. I wasn't really expecting that. Um, and actually, it, it you know I it threw me into like a, a mini tailspin for like three days where I didn't work on the book at all. It's like, ah, you know, cause that's always like a precarious point in a novel, like a hundred pages. Cause you feel like, ah, if I'm going to keep going, you know, I'm going to go to the end or if I quit, you know, a hundred pages, you know, I can work with that later or something like that. But, uh, that's a lot of know, time and work investment, a hundred pages. Yeah, no, it is. And so you most know, thank- people who don't write, they don't understand that. It's like a hundred pages, right. 200 more. You have a full book. Right. No, Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I luckily, you know, I, I took a few days off and sort of just recalibrated. It's like, well, you know, he doesn't know, like he's only seen this part of the story. He doesn't know like sort of the twists that are coming or what I'm really trying to do with the book just yet. So I'm going to do it my way. It has to be first person, you know. So luckily I'd had enough writing experience to believe in myself to be like, okay, this is how it's going to get done. So, you know, I just wrote the book, put my head down and, you know, thought to myself, if my agent doesn't like it, you know, I'll deal with it later. You know, we'll deal with it if we come to that. To my agent's credit, when I sent him the finished draft of A Head Full of Ghosts, he stayed up all night reading it. And his email to me was like, I've never been so happy to write an email to say that I was wrong. Uh, and you are right. So, he, you know, he once he read the whole book, he understood. You know, which was very, you know, w- once that happened, I kind of knew, I felt really good that we were going to be able to sell the book and that it would do okay. So, see, we, we started with dark points and we ended with a moment of triumph. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Ideal. (laughs) Okay, well, we have a question from Michael Weehunt. So he would like to know via Patreon, in terms of audience, craft, and career intentions, what do you feel is the major difference, if any, between the writer you were when you wrote and published your first few novels compared to the writer who approached a head full of ghosts and beyond? I feel like, you know, having gone through sort of the big publisher experience with Henry Holt and it not being such a positive experience with the head full of ghosts, even though I was with a great new publisher and I love my new editor, I also knew that I sort of had to try to make my own 
I had to sort of, you know, not be like an obnoxious self promoter, but I did still, even with having William Morrow behind me, I knew that I had to sort of take advantage or at least reach out to the different people in within my network to try to get the notice out there. Um, you know, and I'm not going to get into any specifics, but you know, a lot of the good press that sort of happened with a head full of ghosts were was indirectly a result of you know some people I know helping to get books to different people, and you know, even the Stephen King tweet. I mean, this was wasn't something that I necessarily. I mean, I tried to get the book to Stephen, <laughs> but sort of unrelated to my efforts to getting the book to Stephen King, I had two, two uh, good friends who, who were friends with Stephen King. And unbeknownst to me, they had sent him, they had both sent him a copy of the book and told him he should read it. So, I mean, that obviously that was amazing. So I guess the short of it is, you know, the thing that I had in place with a head full of ghosts, and even if I wasn't actively using it, like in the case of two friends sending it to Stephen King, was just by the very fact that I had stuck it out so long, I should say so long. I mean, I, I still feel like a young person who's only started writing, but I really have been writing for 15 years, at least professionally. Um, you know, so I've, I, my name has is, is gotten out there and dribs and drabs for a while, but it's certainly gotten out there. So when it was time to, you know, or when I was fortunate enough to have, you know, these new books coming out with the big publisher, having sort of my name out there already in even the littlest ways was a big help. And so that certainly wasn't the case in 2009 when The Little Sleep came out. You know, part of that was they were trying to present me as a, as a crime writer, you know, which is fine. It was my first crime writer or crime novel that I've ever written. Um, yeah, so otherwise, I don't know. I Honestly, I try not to think too much about career other than just, you know, what's the next book that I'm going to do and write because I don't know if this is a comfort or not in some ways. It, it feels like it's still so beyond my control. The only thing that I can control is writing the best stuff that I can. Yeah, that's a very comprehensive answer and I guess in terms <laughs> of thinking about the career intentions what is it that you're kind of looking to achieve now what would you like to do next uh so I'm I'm, I'm sort of I'm focused on hopefully the next two books and you know I don't want to speak too ahead of sort of what's going to happen but I'm hopeful that William Moore will publish a short story collection and a novel uh, that's my goal anyway, because I have enough for a collection. Uh, and I'm actually also planning on writing a couple of short stories that would be connected to A Head Full of Ghosts and Disappearance of Devil's Rock, which I think would be fun to have. After that, I don't know. I've sort of toyed talking to some friends who went to comics, maybe using one of the, the novel summaries that I've written that wouldn't necessarily work as a novel, but maybe it would be a fun comic. You know, Maybe that would, might be kind of fun to mess around with. I'd also love to write go, uh, write like a a comedy again at some point because I have written some hopefully humorous novels and I don't know I feel like after the next books that I'm working on it might be fun to to leave you know the total darkness aside for a book and write something that's kind of fun but we'll see yeah and there's often quite a crossover between comedy and horror just in the sense that the reaction they're both looking to elicit is a very visceral one, whether it's to scare you or to make you laugh. Oh, absolutely. I think sort of that impulse comes from the same place. Like my reaction is to the absurdities of life is either to be terrified or, or to shake my head and laugh. Mm. Um, I mean, for years, I mean, A Head Full of Ghosts is really my first horror novel. Uh, all previously in my writing, like all my short fiction was, was pretty much a horror or horror stories. But when I wrote the longer stuff, like, you know, The Little Sleep, No Sleep to Wonderland, um, swallowing a donkey's eye. I mean, those novels are still pretty dark, but you know, they are satirical. They are hopefully humorous. So yeah, you either gonna, I guess, laugh or be afraid. <laughs> mm. Is that, is that healthy mental, mentally? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have any update on the screen adaptation of a head full of ghosts? Uh, they're working on it. I do know that the screenwriters have uh, turned in like their first official draft to, uh, focus and, and focus seem to, to really like it. So I think, you know, that's still, uh, I guess going then, you know, hopefully, you know, hopefully it goes all the way, <laughs> but you know, so, so far all, all reports have been positive on that front. Oh, that's good. So have you not had any involvement with that then? No, no, I have no, yeah. Contractual say or anything like that, which is fine by me. Um, I'd be hypocritical of me to like say, Oh, this book or this movie must be like the book. Um, I mean, cause in a lot of ways, a head full of ghosts is about like influence. They're the influence the horror genre has had on, me and story and narrative. Um, so I really can't wait to see sort of how, you know, other people sort of take that source material and put their own spin on it. 
So yeah, I always think, find that interesting when you speak to different writers. You know, people want different varying kind of levels of control over mm-hmm. how their work is adapted and where it goes once they've, you know, once yeah. they put it into the world. So yeah, I mean, you know, some people may be more kind of control freaks than, than maybe you are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe if I knew more about like screenwriting or movie making in general, I might have a different opinion. But since, you know, the idea of writing a screenplay kind of fills me with agita. Uh, yeah, I'm, ha- <laughs> yeah. I'm, ha- I'm, ha- I'm happy to let somebody else have at it. <laughs> Fair enough. Anyone oh, who wants too much control, and it, if, if they're going through an adaptation, should write a screenplay. I've tried right. it. And I've got I got halfway through it, and I was like, "Screw this! Uh, it's not it's, it's not for me." I mean, it may be later, but at that time in my life, no, I thought right. I was no. Really I mean, good at it. no. I mean, it's a different kind of writing. It's a it's a you know it's another it's a different skill set, one that you have to put the time into practice and learn about. And, and I'm just you know, it took me this long to to get pretty good at writing fiction, so I'm not right. in a rush to have to start from scratch and learn how to write screenplays. Exactly. And have you written for comics before, speaking of them? No, yeah, th- th- I have not. <laughs> so, like, if I were, I would certainly, you know, I- I've talked to a friend about, hey, how about if we co-write this or, you know, and part of it is just so I could learn what the hell, you know, how to how to approach something like that. Cool. Did Bob just leave? Yeah, it sounded like his <laughs> car was no, just... No, that, got... that's, not even, that's not even for me. Usually, uh, okay. I think that's Dan's <laughs> end, yeah. No, no, nothing to do with me. Uh, <laughs> I'm, not sh- I'm not sure what that was. We all kind of paused, like, what's happened? You'll was have it... to do some uh, special effects. When, that, when this interview is over and I say bye, play that sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what special effects? That was there. <laughs> Well, I like that everyone's denying it. Right. (laughs) Well, talking of a spectral presence, and see, I'll try and segue (laughs) with anything, even even the bits that I'm probably going to cut out. (laughs) So, Daryl Foster would like to know, what was the inspiration behind A Head Full of Ghosts? And is there a significance, personally, or a reflection of yourself in that novel. I thought Daryl, because I know Daryl was going to ask about Brett Savory. <laughs> I am disappointed. <laughs> okay, and then Daryl also <laughs> asks about Brett Savory. <laughs> um, yeah, so A Head Full of Ghosts, uh, it started with sort of a combination of just like cool sort of happenstances. One, I was doing research for that Manson novel, just trying to read like different text that might have related to the apocalypse or horror stories in general. And uh, I came across Centipede's press, uh, Centipede Press's The Exorcism, uh, or The Exorcist, excuse me, Studies in the Night film. They've got like six or seven volumes of these books of essays and um, reviews and interviews of all these different horror movies. Uh, it's a great series. They actually just came out with one for uh, Guillermo del Toro's The Devil's Backbone and Pan's Labyrinth, which is really great too. So anyway, I was reading, I was reading that book, and I was reading these essays about The Exorcist, and a bunch of the essays were talking about sort of the politics of the film. Um, I don't know, and I'd, I hadn't seen the movie in a while, and I'd never really thought of the movie in those terms, and I was totally into it. And it sort of occurred to me, I thought about the market for a second. I was like, huh, you know, the the zombie novel's been around, or there's been plenty of literary updates about the zombie, you know, in the last ten years. Um, there's been a, a bunch of really cool sort of literary werewolf novels too. The vampire never seems to go away. I had a hard time coming up with some recent examples of novels that were about possession or, or you know, exorcism stories. There have been plenty of like crappy Hollywood movies. You know, they, they never stop pumping those out. But uh, I, you know, I really couldn't think of many books besides Sarah Grant's Come Closer, which had you know been published ten years prior. So I started thinking, how would I write an exorcism story or a possession story? Um, and that's how sort of the ball got rolling. And initially, right away, I was like, I want to do sort of like a postmodern, secular, or skeptical approach to it. So, in terms of my own piece to it, I mean, there's that part of it, the, the skeptic in me. Um, you know, so the, obviously the story grew from there. Um, I don't know. I feel like every book's got pieces of me in it. You know, my, my daughter and son <laughs> made their way into Mary quite a bit. My daughter was the same age as Mary's character was when I was writing the book. But some of the stuff that my son, you know, that uh, or his characteristics are really important to the novel as well. 
including his, uh, my son doesn't like spaghetti sauce. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it, and it's funny, you know, when I finish these books, I don't have a hard time sort of separating myself from any personal details that might've made its way into the book because, you know, I have the images of who these people are in my head and they are not like, they're not my friends. They're not my family members. They are, they are these other people. Um, but it's funny to get the reaction from my family, you know, when they read it, cause they're like, Oh, this is dad or this is, <laughs> this is Emma. I'm like, no, this isn't Emma. Yes. I took some things, but it's not her. Um, so, I mean, the pieces always sort of make their way in. They have to. Okay. And if you could give your 20 year old self some advice, what would it be? Uh, uh, don't drink so much Coca-Cola. <laughs> um, eat better. Actually, I'm eating better now. Jeez, the 20 year old. I wasn't even a writer then. Uh, and barely a reader when I was 20. I was, uh, geez, like a junior in college, senior in college, junior. I don't know. I mean, that kid just knew so very little about anything. I feel like I could, I could tell him anything. <laughs> uh, okay. You know, make sure you, uh, remember to sharpen the blade of your lawnmower every once in a while. <laughs> I don't know. I can't really think of anything other than, uh, yeah, I don't know. Sorry. I've awfully answered that question because I wasn't even like a writer at age 20. I, I was just, uh, then I was, I was super obsessed with punk alternative music you know, going to shows all the time, you know, which was a lot of fun. I mean, so I feel like that was sort of like, you know, the formative years of years later when I, when I certainly had a want to, to, I, I had a creative itch, you know, a few years later. And that's definitely because of, you know, my really falling in love with music, you know, during those years. So there you go. There's an answer. Stick with music, but <laughs> start, start writing at some point. <laughs> yeah. Well, how, how would your answer differ if it was to your 30 year old self? So at the point where, you know, you were relatively new to writing. Right. Uh, so I would tell my 30 year old self to not take edits and criticism. So personally, I have since crafted what I call the 24 hour rule, which is indispensable for me. If anyone gives me a critique or even like bad reviews or, but usually it's for edits or critiques. Uh, I, I do not allow myself to respond for 24 hours. And I give myself those 24 hours to, just to be like a whiny, petulant baby. <laughs> like, <laughs> why they don't get it. You know, in my head, I can storm around like, oh, they don't get this. You know, they don't know what they're talking about. And usually after the end of 24 hours, I can be rational about it and say, oh, you know what? This is actually right. Or I can be more rational and say, you know, I think I can see what they're saying, but they're wrong. Yeah, you because know, when I first started, I, I definitely made a few mistakes by responding to edits in not a good way. Um, you know, you, just, you have to learn the hard way, I guess. Um, and I guess the other thing I would tell a 30-year-old me would be to not worry about what other writers were doing or accomplishing and don't waste time being jealous because it doesn't help. Yeah, and I think the 24-hour rule, I mean, it, it's good for a lot of areas of life. I mean, if, <laughs> yes, you, <it> is. <laughs> if you get an email or a message and you kind of have a knee-jerk reaction to it, particularly a negative or angry one, just right. step away from the computer, <laughs> maybe go go for a walk, <laughs> calm down, have a think about it, and then decide, is that really what you want to send? I right. mean, no, some, absolutely. sometimes maybe... It is what you want to send, but, you know, make, make sure that that is the case because, you know, you can't really recall those messages. Not anymore anyway. Right. I think it's no, a case there's... of is it what you should send rather than what you want to send. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Now, there's definitely obvious – I mean, it's obvious there's something about uh, the electronic uh, format of communication that sort of is a direct main line into – uh, anger. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, think, I mean, if you're going to have it, you know, when I think about the editing sort of conversations I've had with people, I definitely don't react the same way. Like it's just, there's something about seeing it and being able to not, you know, not having that person in front of you to see their facial expressions or even just to have that person there for some reason that just, I guess, makes us want to jump to anger. I mean, you can just look at Twitter and comment sections just to see, you know, see that ugliness play out all the time. See, there's no 24-hour rule there. No, there is not. There's a 24-second rule. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's my rule for food on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although 24 seconds is probably too much. 
Yeah, I thought it was the two second roll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it's normally five. Yeah, it's yeah, five. Five, ten was reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> it depends yeah. if, it, if it's a peanut. If it's a peanut M and M, there's no time. Oh, it's like a twenty four hour roll. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> What is this saying about the podcast that the two discussions where we've all been so <laughs> excited that we had to interrupt one another, it's food on the floor and the pronunciation of cuisine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it's horror writers, I guess, looking for, always looking for their next meal. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking of food. I believe, Bob, you've got a question that could well, tie know, in just... nicely to that. <laughs> What would it, you know, uh, with Stephen Graham Jones and you, what, what's the deal with the pickles? <laughs> uh, I, I just got to know. Yeah. I got to know. Stephen gave me a really good pickle story, so I want a good pickle story from you. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, I, just, I, I mean, I've always hated pickles. Just like really hated them. I, I, I was a very picky eater as a child. I mean, I didn't like anything, but uh, my hatred of pickles has always stuck with me. Uh, I will tell you the strangest pickle story. Um, this is not like this is not pickle zero, <laughs> like patient zero. This isn't why I hate pickles, but uh, or maybe it is. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I was very young, probably like seven or eight, and my one of my friend's older sister, who was in high school, was babysitting us. My sister and I, actually the three of us. My brother was really little too, and I remember being in bed and I hear giggling. So my babysitter and one of her friends, and they must have been high or something. But they woke me up. They had actually they were they were sticking it. They stuck a pickle into my ear while I was asleep. I was an eight year old asleep, and they were giggling and sticking a pickle in my ear. And I was like, "Oh, stop it!" <laughs> I forget like that wet ickiness in my ear. It was awful. So there's your pickle story right there. That would be pretty gross. <laughs> yeah, I think I got her back next week. I flashed her. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe that happened before the pickle. I don't know. And the pickle was revenge for my flashing hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was only eight. I cannot be held responsible for these actions. <laughs> yeah. That's anything under 13. You just, you know, there's no responsibility. There. <laughs> pickle in the ear. See, that would, that would probably gross me out. Cause I don't even like Q-tips in my ear. Oh, really? Yeah. So, I mean, it's like, you know, well, of course, you know, you hygiene and all that, you got to do that, but it's just, you know, it's always been a, like, a, uh, you know, hmm. well, try, so, yeah, maybe that. try a pickle. I don't know. Maybe after the pickle, <laughs> the, the Q-tip won't seem so bad. <laughs> uh, so it's a, it's a tactile thing. Hmm. Yeah. That's weird. That's very strange. It is. Well, away from pickles <laughs> and things that make you unhappy. What makes you happy in life? <laughs> I'm just laughing. It's, you know, we should juxtapose that with the, you know, the darkest moments in writing. Yeah. yeah. What, what makes me happy in life? Yeah. I'm, see, I'm, I'm just like analyzing all of the yeah. little facets and areas. <laughs> uh, I mean, my my family makes me extremely happy. They're a lot of fun. My kids are, are very cool kids. They are extremely nice somehow, despite having me. Partly because no one's ever stuck a pickle in their ears. Yeah, I think yeah. that's what that's what that's what turns you. Mm. Uh, it's like Wolfbane. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, honestly, um, I wish more writers, and I think a lot of horror writers find this. I wish more writers in general have sort of found uh, the warmth and community that I have found with the friends that I've made, you know, over the fifteen years writing. I don't think there's any way I would be sort of the writer that I am without the support of so many friends and so many other writers. I mean, really that's been like, we talked about meeting like some of my musicians and heroes that way, but you know, just there are so many writers that, you know, and colleagues you know, who are my best friends that are doing such amazing work. And, you know, you know, like, so John Langan and, uh, you know, Laird Barron right off the top of my head who, you know, I talk to John at least once a week on the phone, you know, and Stephen Graham Jones too, we're always texting each other. And it's, I don't know, it just it makes it feel like you're in this together you're all working toward doing the same thing, um, right. you know, which is sort of trying to add to this, you know, centuries long conversation that is horror fiction. You know, to me, that's the cool one of the cool parts about horror is there is so much great work before it. And the people who read horror, most of them have read all these stories that have come before it. So you get to have this you know, dialogue that spans decades um, and your stories get to react to other stories. I just don't know how many other you know, genres or modes that you get to do that in in such a sort of um, intimate way. So 
Yeah. Um, uh, I love horror. <laughs> And I hate it too. I mean, I hate the bad horror, but you know, horror sort of makes me happy. I like playing basketball, I like going for walks in the woods. Not so much. I don't go for walks on the beach. That's not me. <laughs> and obviously, and, and, and I, we talked about music is. Like, oh. <laughs> did did uh, you just fall over or something? This is like a scene from Unfriended or something. <laughs> oh no, sorry. <laughs> oh my I God, just... they got Paul. Shit. <laughs> it's spectral presence. <laughs> You'll never yeah. believe it. Brett, Brett Savory just like came crashing into the house and slapped the phone out of my hand. <laughs> and I, then he I, left. I have to say, can next time the, the spirits or monsters or whatever take out somebody you know who's not the most famous person on the show? You know, <laughs> Maybe me or Michael next time. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there we go. That, that made you guys happy, so that makes me happy too. <laughs> mm-hmm. I can't remember what the hell you were saying. That just, no. uh, it just totally threw me. Now. No, he, no, was was being, awesome. he was talking about being happy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> then he happily got attacked. Fucking yeah. savory. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, see, if you talk about happiness too much, that's when the poltergeist comes out and just starts throwing stuff around. Yeah. Well, considering there was that traffic noise that no one wanted to kind of <laughs> claim, right. I, I, I think at the as we get to the end of the conversation, we're just going to find, like, oh, Brett Saver is also part of the call because, you know, <laughs> we've now said his name far more than three times and he appears. That's right. <laughs> Candy man. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so before we wrap up, Bob or Dan, do you have any other questions you want to throw down? I think I think everything that I wanted to, to uh, ask has been covered. Yes, yeah, same here. I mean, we've we've kind of ticked off the the white whales question, which I normally ask as well. Mm. We keep that one back for the end, but, but yeah, that's been and gone too. Yeah. What's the white whale question? Um, <laughs> essentially, you know what what are you? You know, what are the white whales in your career so far? You oh, know, what, see, yeah, yeah. what else would you kind of like to achieve? But, right. you know, we've we've kind of ticked those off. Sure. You know, through the course of other questions. God damn it. Right. <laughs> Unless you want to ask a new white whale question, which is about a literal white whale. You know, what, <laughs> what, what would you do if you were confronted with a white whale, you know, on a little <laughs> raft boat? <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't see myself ever being in a little raft or a boat. No. <laughs> uh, at least not that far out. Yeah, it's a hi- <laughs> highly specific hypothetical. <laughs> yeah. Well, what are two items that you can't live without? You know, obviously besides uh, my family, etc. We'll, we'll talk about like non-essential. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm yeah. not sure that you should see your family as an item, really. <laughs> right. All no, non-essential. Right. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, like water. You kind of need water to survive, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, for me, it's music and reading, uh, you know, not necessarily that order. I, I have to be reading something, you know, otherwise I feel like my writing suffers. I feel like I get, I get dumber or dumber <laughs> <laughs> if, if I'm not reading. Um, yeah, and I just get so much inspiration from music. So many of my, my own titles have come from, you know, lyrics or whatnot. So writing and writing and reading, or excuse me, reading and music. Do you listen to music when you write? I prefer silence, but if there's stuff going on, I'll put on headphones. And if I listen to music, it has to be instrumental. I can't have lyrics because the lyrics will distract me because I'm a fan of lyrics and I would focus in on those. So with right. the head full of ghosts, actually, I wrote, uh, I almost always started with uh, the soundtrack to the movie Ravenous. I don't know if you've seen that movie. It was, uh, came out in the late 90s. It's a great Love movie. Love that movie. Love yeah. it. Yeah. And it's such a quirky soundtrack, too. So. Um, I've listened to that so many times. It's, you know, it's, it's total background music for me. So it's, it's good to listen to. I've also bought some other, I've started using the witch, the soundtrack to the witch, which is really cool. Um, and the soundtrack to it follows as well. Oof. Yeah, it follows yeah. soundtrack get, gets to me. I can't, yeah. uh, there's only certain cuts off of it. I can listen to. <laughs> yeah. I think we were discussing that in the, <laughs> in the Patreon episode, weren't we? When we were, Talking about oh, yeah. music that we write to, but the witch, the witch soundtrack is is uh, rather creepy too. Yeah, no, they they definitely are. So I use that for inspiration, but when I'm writing, especially at night, so oh, oh, oh. <laughs> turn on the yeah, lights. If I, yeah, if I was by myself in the house, I, I would not be listening to those two soundtracks. <laughs> <laughs> but you said that you can't properly concentrate if you've got 
lyrics, but I mean, if you're writing and it is in a busy environment and there's a lot of people chatting, do you find that you have to put the headphones on then or can you just zone out other people? You can do a little zone out, but if it is like going to be chatty like that, I'll, I'll definitely, that's when I go to the headphones. Mm. All right. And where can our listeners connect with you? Uh, well, so my, I guess my, my website is paultremblay.net. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Paul G. Tremblay. You know, I'm, I'm on Facebook as well. Yeah, I'm pretty much just out there in the internet ether staring back at you. <laughs> <laughs> and before we go, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Uh, geez, I would, since I mentioned my friends John and Laird, I would say do keep an eye out for their new books coming out. Uh, John Langan's the no- novel The Fisherman is fantastic. It comes out in a few weeks from Word Horde Press. And Word Horde is just doing such amazing uh, – it's putting out such amazing books. You know, uh, Olivia Llewellyn's collection, Furnace, from earlier this year was awesome as well. I'm looking forward to Word Horde's collection from Mike Griffin as well, which I have. I just have to carve some time out to read it. And Laird has a collection coming out in the fall, I believe, called Swift to Chase. And uh, I had the honor of writing the intro to it. And I'm really excited for go. people. Yeah, I'm really excited for people to read this collection because it definitely reads like, you know, it's recognizably Laird, but at the same time, um, he's going in a little different direction. Like, it would be easy for him to just to sort of try to repeat all the the cosmic Lovecraftian horror stuff that he you know did in sort of his first couple collections. And in this collection, I feel like he really sort of stretches and expands. And man, uh, it's great. It's just really great. I think it's his best collection. Yeah. Well, Word Hood picked up Publisher of the Year from Addis's Horror Awards last year. That's and right. Yeah. So mm-hmm. and they also got Anthology of the Year. So I mean. Our listeners and readers are certainly giving them the seal of approval too. Yeah, and please uh, thank you to you guys and your listeners and readers for you know the award for a head full of ghosts. Uh, I was very excited and touched by that. Oh yeah, I mean, well, for me personally, it it was one of my favorites of the year. But you know, it, it's the the listeners <laughs> and the readers ultimately that got to to right. choose it. So yeah. Well deserved, as far as I'm concerned. Well, thank Definitely. you. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say actually the only other thing I'd mention would be a tiny little bit of a plug, but uh, my the, these two books will actually finally be available in the, the UK uh, as Titan Books is publishing Disappearance of Devil's Rock on July 1st, and A Head Full of Ghosts on September 27th, I believe. So I'm very I'm very excited and happy that the books will be available in England and Ireland and Australia now. Yeah, and Titan has been a lot of fun. They sent me, <laughs> they sent me a bunch of free stuff, including uh, some awesome Hannibal TV show, Hannibal, a book, and they sent me four little figurines. So I was totally geeking out because Hannibal is my favorite TV show of the last, you know, last few years. That's one thing I noticed about Titan. Whenever I was writing for uh, Manarchy, is we did a, a lot of uh, reviews for that. They they love to send out stuff. It's amazing. Yeah. You ask for one thing, you get a box, and you're just like, what's all this? Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> I nice. wanted something about Dead Space. They sent me everything. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, just I'd, I'd keep a good relationship with them. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I've been very happy. Uh, I know. I, I They asked me if I'm getting over to England anytime soon, and I don't know. Maybe next summer. Well, I'll try to shoot for that. Sounds awesome. Yeah, that's a, a little spoiler then, perhaps, for the future. <laughs> In the uh-huh. UK. There you go. Yeah, it's it's interesting how there are still quite a number of deals where the publication is exclusive to the US so that you then have this unusual situation where people have their book in the US published by one publisher and then in the right. UK by another. And I, you'd kind of think, particularly as things are getting more digital and it's easier to distribute things globally anyway that soon there'll be a complete stop to that yeah i don't know i mean uh for the writer if if you know, especially if you have an agent or an agency that will actively help to sell the global rights of your book financially you're, you're better off only selling at least in the united states north american rights because then you know every time a book sells to another country you know i i get those advances as opposed to yeah, William Morrow, if we had given William Morrow world rights. Mm. Uh, 
So, but the other side of it, it, it did take a while to sell the book in, in the UK. So the downside was these books have been out, or at least a head full of ghosts was out for a while. And I was getting tons of messages from people in England. When am I going to get the book? I'm like, ah, I don't know. Please don't torrent it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's but, pros and cons to it, definitely. Yeah. But no, very excited. Uh, yeah, I think we're up to like uh, 13 countries with a head full of ghosts, which is really cool. Definitely. Oh, yeah. That is phenomenal. And on that note, thank you very much for spending a couple of hours of your morning speaking with us. It's been a great deal of fun and really informative, too. Well, thank you, uh, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, I love your website, love the podcast and the support you know, that This Is Horror has, has given me in the past year and a half is really means a lot to me. I could not, I, I, I will not be able to repay you enough. Yeah, well, it's been an absolute pleasure and I wish you the best of luck for the release of Disappearance at Devil's Rock. Thank you. Yes, everyone go buy it at some point when it's available. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you for listening to episode 99 of the This Is Horror podcast with Paul Tremblay. Next time we will be recording a live podcast with David Moody for episode 100. We're hoping to do that on Sunday, but keep a lookout on the This Is Horror website for further announcements on that. Of course, you'll always get early access to our news via our Patreon and if you support us on Patreon, you can help keep the show alive. So head on over to www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Pledge just one dollar. Get early bird access to all of the podcasts. Get access to the interviews in their entirety. So we don't have to mess about with any of this part one, part two stuff. No, you can you get it all. So we're going to do it on the Patreon at the $4 level and above. There are also rewards including free ebooks, This Is Horror t-shirts, discounts off purchases from the This Is Horror shop, even early bird access to Scott Nicolay's The Outer Dark, which, of course, if you didn't hear the news, it has returned, it is back, and it's on This Is Horror, thisishorror.co.uk. The place to be for your horror news. Another way that you can support This Is Horror is to head on over to Redbubble, redbubble.com, and purchase a This Is Horror t-shirt. Amazing designs by the wonderful talent that is Pi Par. There's a raven, there's a skull, there's even some bizarre, weird octo-terror design for those fans of weird fiction. Very cool. Before we go, a quick word from our sponsor, Grey Matter Press. They're among us. They live down the street, in the apartment next door, and in our own homes where they stare back at us from our bathroom mirrors. Peel Back the Skin is a volume of horror that rips the mask off the real monsters of our time, mankind. Featuring a star-studded cast of award-winning authors, Jonathan Mayberry, Tim LeBon, Ray Garden, Graham Masterson, and many more, Peel Back the Skin is the powerhouse new release from Grey Matter Press. Get more info at peelbacktheskin.com. There it is, so if you haven't already, do consider checking out Peel Back the Skin. Great anthology. And of course, another publisher that's great is Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. A novel I'm looking forward to reading. Train derails in Boston, so let's have a quick word. From our sponsor. Cherrywood Lodge is haunted and thank fuck for its ghost. Rebecca Malone has problems, not just alcohol. Her biggest issues start with the moment she discovers a chest of ancient Majon tiles in the basement of her new house, causing her life to spin out of control with hallucinations, sexual deviances, and grossly murders. Ghost dongs and the haunted houses and demon orgies, oh my. Jessica McHughes, the train derails in Boston, it's now available online wherever books are sold. Okay, that's all for this week. Remember to check back with us for episode 100. If you can join us live, that'd be fantastic. Please do. Would love it. 
be a part of it. It's going to be interactive. It's going to be fun. Dave Moody on the This Is Horror podcast. So be good to one another. Read horror. Have a great, great day. Okay, good. Dan, go and Sorry. paint your house. <laughs> Will do, mate. <laughs> I had some, some dust at the base. Is that what you hear when I do that? Could be. See, you, you know, you can't move dust on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll quit touching it. <laughs> okay. That's good, that's good advice for life. Quit touching it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Have we got that on the, out, yeah. on the outtakes, Michael? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> going in. <laughs> <laughs> they can expect... Uh, Three podcasters for a British podcast touching the microphone too often. <laughs> <I'm just kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, inside joke. I don't know if the, the microphone stuff will make the cut. But anyway, uh, <laughs> from the top. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, sure. It's a harsh taskmaster is Michael. Well, I'm... Yeah. <laughs> so, so when i when i go on brett savory's podcast i'm totally attracted <laughs> yeah I, I like that you know in the space of an hour we've evolved from brett savory doesn't have a fucking clue about modern technology to creating an actual podcast for him yeah i'm you know i'm assuming once he hears his podcast he'll learn about it yeah yeah that, that makes a great deal of sense there you go <laughs>